for joining us today. And so I hope you are all looking forward uh, to what should be an engaging and sometimes challenging and unreservedly timely discussion. So to begin with, my name is Annette Hay, and amongst a few other things I won't bore you with right now, I am the lead for the BME Staff Network at Coventry University. And whilst I have so much to say about this topic, and I'm sure I will interject when I have something burning to add or share, I'm going to keep my bit as brief as possible so that we can make a start and use the time we have listening and interacting with as many views as possible. The idea and title for this event came to me sometime in early June whilst planning for the first event of this series in actual fact, which was simply called How Much Do Black Lives Matter? And it occurred to me then that the term white allies, which had been banded about in various circles way before the killing of George Floyd, had appeared to have somewhat morphed into something you could learn in one-off training sessions in much the same way that unconscious bias had become. And whilst I did not object to the term in principle, I would often find myself challenging others on what the term meant and how it was being interpreted by black and white people. And I would always ask the question, well, what about black allies? And then there would be those unsettling occasions whereby I might find myself reading a particular article or watching a webinar or in a conversation with a white person who would almost imply that by just being an ally gave them a get out of jail card from being racist or doing anything racist or that it automatically made them become, an, become anti-racist overnight. Now I'm sure as many of us here know already, it doesn't quite work like that. This is by no way suggesting that this is reflective or descriptive of all white people or all white allies, but just a demonstration of the complexity um, and the many misconceptions and potential pitfalls that exist when using this term and phraseology. And it's also a very small insight into some of the exacerbation felt by black people as a consequence. So this event is about having an open and honest discussion, giving an insight into various and or even opposing lived experiences, providing constructive and challenging advice or not, as may be the case, but always being respectful of the different views, positions and perspectives in this virtual room. We should all be prepared to hear constructive and supportive criticisms or challenges so that we might begin an ongoing conversation on where we might better position the term or interpretation of what it really means to be a white ally. If you want to tweet about this event, then please tag in the BME staff network and that's at covuni underscore BME. So that's at covuni underscore BME and perhaps hashtag how much do black lives matter. As most of you will know by now, technology does not always work. And we've just had an example of that already because my screen's gone, I'm hoping it will come back. And even when it does, it's not always the smoothest of experiences, but my colleagues and I will do our best. Like I said, there could be up to 200 people. I think we've had over 200 people register, but not everybody will, will arrive in the room at any one time. So I will try my best to get as many different views as possible in the time that we have. This means that I will have to use my hosting powers via Zoom to manage who speaks and for how long sometimes. So I'm apologising now if I have to interrupt anyone, it's only so we can hear as many voices as possible. We will take questions and comments after all of the speakers have finished. So if you want to ask a question, you can either write it in the Q&A or if you prefer, speak, uh, sorry, prefer to speak, raise your hand and we'll come to you. We will be taking questions using both options and get around as many people as we can. You can raise your hand by using the hand icon, which you can see if you click on the participant list in the bar at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to use the chat too, but please post questions in the Q&A only. If you are invited to speak, please wait a moment whilst we adjust your settings so you can put your camera, and camera on and unmute. And can I ask that you be succinct so that I do not have to interrupt anyone if at all possible. Once you've finished speaking, we will mute and turn off your camera again. Today's recording, today's recording and the previous recording if, um, for the events that we've had in this series will all be made available on the new BME Staff Network, Network website, which will be launched later this month. So please look out for it. At the end of this event, you will have the opportunity to complete a three question survey. It will take about one minute to complete. So please do that if you can. And finally, a reminder that we will be recording the session today, so please be on notice. 
I will now briefly introduce the three guest speakers before going straight into our session. So our first speaker is Dr. Marie Charles. Dr. Marie Charles initially taught as a primary class teacher before moving into pedagogical research and teacher education. With a career spanning over 30 years, she has taught across the range from young children to adults in higher education institutions in the UK, USA, and in many other parts of the world. Dr. Charles has published extensively in international peer reviewed journals and is the co-author of a trilogy of research-based books on formative teaching based on multimodalities and multiliteracies. Multiliteracies, sorry, it's a hard word to say. Dr. Charles is also the director of Many Faces in Teaching organization, which gathers and publishes research-based programs to empower the learner and facilitator. Dr. Charles has a doctorate in cultural studies and humanities with a special focus on curriculum writing and reconceptualized a curriculum program called Reframed Units of Change in 2019 and was published in the Journal of Black Studies. Dr. Charles has developed a teaching program around the genesis of geometry, which is linked to our African, our African origins and the subsequent migrations out of Africa. After Marie, our next speaker will be Malcolm Cumberbatch. Malcolm is a public intellectual. After a positive early education in Barbados, he studied politics, economics, and sociology at Westminster and London Burbeck universities. He studied mediation at Regents University, London. He was taught theoretical social sciences at Westminster and Sheffield universities, theoretical applied social sciences at Sheffield Hallam, and was a researcher in business school at Loughborough University. Malcolm was also a civil servant and a manager of economic development at Haringey Council. He is a qualified mediator in conflict resolution, activist, writer, mentor, and publisher. His Swimming Against the Tide, Eric and Jessica Huntley, 2019, is about the her heroic fight against racism. Malcolm is a visiting lecturer at Hallam University and a race equality commissioner in Sheffield. Malcolm was the first person to design and teach Africa before colonialism in a British university. He is committed to applying theory to social and economic problems. And last but certainly not least will be our very own and very esteemed Professor Gus John. Professor Gus John is a scholar activist who has done notable work in the fields of education policy, the role of schooling and education in promoting social justice, so school improvement, management and international development. Since the 1960s, he has been active in issues of education and schooling in Britain's inner cities. He was assistant education officer and head of community education in the Inner London Education Authority and in 1989 became the first African director of education and leisure services in Britain. Professor Gus John has been an associate professor of education and, and honorary fellow of the London Centre for Leadership in Learning at the UCL Institute of Education. And from 2016, visiting professor at Coventry Uni University, where he works with the vice chancellor and university leadership team in improving the strategic management of the university and building a culture of equity. So welcome all our guests, thank you. So before we begin, if I could just ask my two amazingly helpful and supportive colleagues um, who will be helping out with the technology and also with the Q&A today, um, if they could just put their cameras on and introduce themselves quickly and then we can make a start straight into the um, presentations or speaking. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon all. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, my name is Fiona Secondino and um, welcome to the session. I'm looking forward to a very interesting session today and thank you very much for participating. Hello everybody, my name is Kosa Hussein. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, then, so oops, I think we're going to have our first speaker, which is going to be Dr. Marie Charles. So we'll put her camera on and we'll put her in the view. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You, you can start speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you for the kind invitation today and that I am joined 
by some wonderful, wonderful colleagues, Professor Bruce John and Malcolm Cumberbatch. Thank you. Now, today I thought that I would start in reverse uh, my opening from an asset building paradigm that begins with self and the individual before we can start talking about microaggressions and white allyship. For me, the framework has to begin with self. And there were three questions that um, the esteemed Dr. Asa Hilliard asked us that every human being should be able to answer three fundamental questions. And they are, who am I? Where in the world am I? And how in the world did I get here? Now, I don't mean from a first, second or third generational response. I'm talking about the deep archeological, linguistic, anthropological, genomic baseline. So it's critical that we begin to answer these three questions from an African-centered worldview. Why? Because we are then asserting not only our human agency, but equally our psychological, cultural and historical realities. When we have a healthy, empowering and accurate knowledge of self, we're able to construct a conceptual framework, a language and context to combat, understand and define what is happening to us and the daily microaggressions that we experienced not only as children in the education system, but as adults in the workplace and school, colleges and so on. But what are microaggressions? Dr. Daryl Wing Sue talks about microaggressions as everyday verbal, non-verbal and environmental slights or snubs or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalised group membership. Sorry, Dr. Marie, sorry to just interrupt. Can you just try and speak a lot louder? I know we've had problems. I've tried to explain to people, but can you just try and speak a bit louder? Because oh, people... Okay, okay. Uh, is, that, is, is that any better? Yes, yeah, so if you can speak up the whole time. I'm sorry, I know it's not natural, but if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So if we look with more specificity to the work of Dr. Chester Pierce, um, he talks about racial microaggressions. Is that any clearer? Is, is that, is it that is, part? yeah, but yeah, the more, yeah, as loud as you can, just as loud as you can, because it's very <laughs> funny. Sorry. It's okay, okay. So Dr. Pierce makes um, a real distinction when he talks about racial microaggressions. And he says that it's not that we look for the gross and the obvious. We must look for the subtle, the cumulative and the mini assault that is the substance of today's racism. He says these assaults are characterized by white put downs and they can be automatic, pre-conscious or unconscious in fashion and the negative effects on the stability of the mind and the body are real. So from Dr. Chester Pierce and his specificity in terms of the mind and the effects of those microaggressions, it's real. And the body encodes racism as a violent act. And that's really important that we understand that. So that our body, our emotions, our mind and our spirit are ultimately affected from those white put downs that Chester Pierce talks about. We have to stop telling our children and ourselves that sticks and stones may break our bones and names will never hurt us because it's real. And so as a consequence of the microaggressions that, that we experience on a daily basis, there's some very important work coming out of America by Dr. William A. Smith 
And he talks about this conceptual framework and the effects and consequences of the microaggressions on self. And he calls this racial battle fatigue, RBF, as a real phenomenon. And his definition of racial battle fatigue is the result of psychological and physiological stress overload from specific race-related relationships between a racially marginalized, oppressed individual group on his or her environment. And so for me, as a pedagogist, teacher, educator, I'm very interested in the, the psychological and physiological impacts of microaggressions. But if we don't know how to deal with that as individuals and self, then once we get down that rabbit hole and we don't have a ladder, what are we going to do? And he says, uh, Dr. William A. Smith, racial battle fatigue, that this stress is a sick signal. And this signal is with us all the time. We can't turn it off because that is the very nature of our interactions in our workplace and in the school. So we must be prepared. We must have our inoculations, our antidotes, our PPE. And what is our PPE? Our PPE is our African worldview. It is understanding who we are from those three questions that I began with. Who am I? Where in the world am I? And how in the world did I get here? So for example, if we just take that first question, who am I? And look at the effects of microaggressions and apply an African worldview. We look at the word psych, psycho, uh, sorry, we look at the word psychology and we look at the root word of psychology, which is psyche. We take the article P away and we have suku from an African perspective, which becomes saku. Now we have some vowel changes there, which is umlaut and epenthesis through time, vowels change the, the, the spellings of words. But what we have is seeking the saku, which is the spirit, the illumination of our mind, our essence of who we are. And that has been recorded in ancient Kemet in one of the temples uh, through the work of Dr. Theophile Obenga. And he has um, uh, a scene in his book of lector priests who are chanting the many saku, seeking the saku which is the illumination of the soul and the spirit. So even from an African perspective, we have to understand the psychological impact of microaggressions on our African selves and reclaim that very term which Western medicine has reclaimed for itself, but from a wrong paradigm. So those three questions I would begin with in the sense that it grounds our very identities. Who am I? How in the world did I get here? And where in the world am I? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marie Charles. Um, really appreciate that. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to go straight over to the next speaker. So the next speaker is um, Malcolm Cumberbatch. So Malcolm, we're going to unmute you and put your camera on. Oops, where are you? I'll start your video and I'm going to unmute. You can speak now, Malcolm, we're ready for you. Oh, you need to unmute, hold on. Can you unmute yourself, Malcolm? Yeah, yeah. That's it, thank you. And can you speak up as well, please, so people can hear? Thank you. Um, tell me if you can't hear me at any no, time. A bit louder, I don't know what's going on, so can you just speak a bit louder? Thank you. 
Yeah, um, I've got a low voice, and um, I'm up to 100% on my uh, my system anyway. So I, I'm I'm honoured to be here, and very glad that, that you've invited me. Um, I I totally agree with Marie because um, I'm an African-centered philosopher as well, and I I, I take the work of uh, Malefia Santi quite quite seriously. And whether we if we are, are at the North Pole, we have to say, "Who am I? I am African." Wherever we are, you know, you, you can't forget that. That takes you through. So, what I wanted to say today is, are three three key things. Talk about privilege. Talk about, you know, as we say, white privilege. I mean, because we don't have any, any privilege. Uh, the types of folk that you meet in the, in the line of oppression. The poor, according to Anne Bishop. Anne Bishop is a, 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 a Canadian lady who has done some amazing work. And her book, Becoming an Ally, is something I think you should all get hold of, because whether you whether you're African or European, you should read and and Bishop's book. And we, she and I, uh, have colluded on a number of projects before. Um, so, what is an ally? Is the next thing I want to talk about, and and some examples of of what what allies do, and. But I want to start with a small bit of history, just very quickly. Um, the period around 1600 was when a lot of things happened, good and bad, mostly bad. Uh, it's when the Mayflower left this country to go to the United States. Uh, also, uh, Elizabeth I, signed the, um, the proclamation of getting rid of uh, black people from Britain, as she called them, the, the Blackamoors. So Thomas Hobbes wrote Leviathan. And if you are a politics, social science scholar, you will know what Leviathan was all about, because the state of play in this country was desperate. The, you know, there was bloodletting everywhere, and you know it wasn't the sort of place people wanted to live. That's why the Pilgrim Fathers, the Puritans, escaped to America, and look what happened there. So English history, if you read G.M. Trevelyan, if you read uh, Gordon Child, if you read E.P. Thompson, you will see that things weren't beautiful here. And if you go way back in, into feudalism, you will know that the lot of the worker, the serf and the peasant, was completely destructive. Uh, talk about laws, slave laws, and so on. What the serfs had was glee by abscripti, yoke to the soil. So only the aristocracy was uh, known to enjoy life. So white privilege, if you like, is something that was gained through the enslavement of African people, uh, colonialism, the genocide of African people and peoples in the Americas, you know, Incas, uh, Apaches, you, you name it, Mi'kmaq people, and all those people now are, are gone, and only a few live on reservations. So white privilege comes from that, and for the last 400 years, we've been under the hammer speaking as African people, and. So between one George Floyd and another George Floyd, what what happens? You shouldn't think that a sunny day out in the park 
demonstrating or down the street is what allies do or Black Lives Matter people do because a hell of a lot of stuff is going on and as Marie has pointed out you could get 20 microaggressions per day so when you see someone sort of bursting with anger and they explode that's just the last straw they've had about 25 microaggressions already for the day or in a couple of days and they, they think I've had enough and it's happening it happens in the best of places I've been to Trinity College Cambridge to a session with the students down there and I saw two lecturers, two African lecturers, and about 20 students huddled together as people in a refuge talking about the things they have to kind of abide with every day, every day at Cambridge. And you think Cambridge is the beacon of knowledge and of decency and so on. Not so at all. Um, these people were saying, you know, all the things that happened to them. And what, what um, microaggressions can be verbal or nonverbal. This, um, this young student said that there was a quiz one evening. And she answered two questions correctly. And people fell on the floor. They, they looked at her with such, such looks. How can she know that? And we didn't. And so that kind of thing. And she was left feeling sort of like, you know, I can't even answer two questions at a quiz. Um, people are after me all the time. And that sort of thing, uh, you know, I white people don't have to bear. If I was looking for a job now and I was going to saw a job in a paper or something in Exeter or some other white enclave, I'd have to think, when, first of all, I would probably think that's not for me, even though I measured up to all of yeah, the, the job description and the person spec, etc. I would have to think, oh, I can't go there. Um, you know, I'd be isolated. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't um, be comfortable. They'll all be after me. And that is not something that happens to, uh, you know, people say, you know, white folks say, oh, it's actually it's lovely. Oh, 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 I'm going for this job, you know. Uh, the kids will be fine there. Every, Everybody be fine there, you know, I'll have lots of goodies. Yeah, we can't do that. We have to think. Will there be anything there that will be a, of, of, of sucker to, to us, you know? It, so that, that's white privilege. Now, becoming an ally is different. It, you have to have, you have to unlearn oppression. And you have to see yourself as an oppressor before you can do that. You, you, allies are on the way, they're on the journey, they're taking action. And they are looking at self and thinking, what is it that I do that they can't do? And we have to talk to them, you know, the ones that are seen as them. There's a them and us situation. We have to talk to the black lives and find out what it is that happens to them and how can I help. We have to be, they have to be anti-racist. They can't be saying we're an ally and we don't challenge our, our other colleagues and so on. Um, you know, it, it's amazing. I, I've been through that. From the time I landed in this country, People have been microaggressing me and, and, and trying to, thankfully I haven't been uh, violently attacked, but the, um, 
the barber I went to in Kensington, because I didn't know any other barbers, he said to me, so you heard the streets were paved with gold, didn't you? And I was stunned, you know, and he kept saying it. He kept calling me sunshine and curly and all sorts of things like that. And to this day, you still get that. Somebody said to me when I was a young civil servant, they said, you know, um, how does your girlfriend see you at night? Do you have to smile or, you know, that sort of thing so they can, she can see your teeth? And, and, you know, so these are things that are still happening in, in offices and all over the, the, the country. You know, when you go into a store, the security man at the door, he was doing nothing all day. People were coming in by the droves. And as you go, he's running down the aisles, all the aisles to see where you are and what you're doing. And, and as you come out and you pay, he, he goes back to his point and, and pretends he, he was doing nothing. So those are the things that you look for. And those are the things you have to uh, criticize the best of your friends you, you need to criticize when you say you're an ally. Uh, you have to say, look, that's, you shouldn't be saying that, that's racist. So you have to unlearn oppression. You have to read your history. You have to see what, what happened in history. And so that's when you know that you're beginning to be on the way. I just, just to finish off, and Bishop, in, in her beautiful book, this has been recently reprinted, Becoming an Ally, she says, there are four peoples. There's the ones, the allies, who are, are examining themselves and, and on the way. Then there are the deniers. Slavery never happened, colonialism never happened. And you know in Germany that people can be put in prison for the Holocaust denial. But we, we deny everything here. And as Charles de Mert say, the colonizer wants to deny that he's colonized. And what Stuart Hall used to call historical amnesia. Uh, so they're them. They're the guilty ones who say, the individualists, they say, I can't get involved with that. You know, I've got this busy job. Um, I'm doing, you know, things. I'm, I'm looking after myself. Um, I'm very important sort of thing. They're the backlashes who talk about PC gone mad, you know, people with thin skin and, and chips on their shoulders and stuff like that. And, you know, there, there is, there, there's people who were seriously thinking, I need to be an ally. How do I do it? And we need to help them as well, but they need to come forward. And the best allies I could think about at the moment, I was thinking about that the other day, and I was thinking, those white guys and the Indian who stood shoulder to shoulder with Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu and so at the, the Rivonia trial and who went to prison in Robin Island, Ahmed Kafrada um, and, and Dennis Goldberg, they, they went to prison. But the people who equally helped, they joined the ANC, Joe Slovo and Ruth First, Graham Fisher, they all suffered for it under the apartheid regime. Rufus was blown up in her office, and then Slovo and Bram Fisher had suffered terribly for aiding and abetting um, Mandela and, and Susulu. So, and that's the sort of ally. I'm not saying everybody needs to do that. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it's it means something when you see something wrong and you say, "Look, I'm going to help you." You have to think, yes, I need to change myself. And that's it. It's a lot happens between one George Floyd and another George Floyd. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for that, Malcolm. Um, yeah, that was very interesting. So we've had two very interesting um, perspectives. Um, so now we're going to go finally to Professor Gus, and then after Gus we can go to questions and answers. So can I just encourage people to, if you've got any questions um, or comments, can you start putting them in the Q&A, please? Uh, we'd really welcome it. So we're just going to put Gus on now. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Yes, we can hear you, Gus. Okay. Um, can I have the first slide, please, uh, Annette? Okay. So, friends, I want to do this in three parts. Um, and leave some time for us to have some uh, discussion. I want to talk briefly about what I see as a problem with allyship. Then I want to talk about ways in which uh, microaggressions happen in our space day by day, and ending up saying what I think we need to do to, to, to do about all this. So what problem do I have with allyship? A story. Um, I was holed up in Nigeria between March and uh, the middle of July because of COVID and other uh, issues. Um, in July, I received a request to sign a letter which eventually ended up being signed by just under 400 academics and university staff. The letter was to William, uh, to Gavin Williamson, the MP, whom we've heard a lot from in the last period, asking him to ring fence some funds for the Equality and Human Rights Commission to monitor what universities were doing um, in relation to a number of actions that this group wanted them to, to implement. Um, the letter embraced the notion of allies and allyship, referring to signatories who do not identify as what they call BAME, as our allies, a term whose meaning is taken for granted and is assumed to be totally unproblematic. But casting non-BAME folk in the role of allies rather suggests that they are joining us in our mission to tackle racial injustice in higher education and as such working to our agenda and under our leadership. The burden of expunging racism from the society and its institutions, including higher education, is not what you might call the black man's burden. We endure racism in its structural, cultural, institutional, and personal manifestations in a society that validates white folk automatically and puts us through various filters before we could be considered capable, competent, and able to fit in. We, as Black people, neither create nor perpetuate racism. White people inhabit and sustain racist cultures and environments, which we experience as hostile, inhospitable, and injurious to our wellness and well-being. White allies in an all-white senior leadership team providing services to a significant global majority clientele, for example, would be quite happy adding more like themselves to that team while arguing that there are not enough BAME people in the pipeline to qualify for such senior posts. They take no responsibility for the fact that even within their own institutions, BAME people could be found in numbers at the mouth of the pipeline or clog it, clogging up the middle with a little prospect of scaling the barriers of exclusion 
that prevent them getting near the top. When our allies accept and are happy to live with that situation as the status quo, or when they themselves constitute that status quo, they do not become comrades in arms simply by choosing to join our struggle for racial justice. They become our allies when they put their own career progression at risk and independently of us, independently of us, challenge those structures because they have no desire to be part of an institution that denies leadership and management opportunity to so-called BAME people and does not actively promote racial justice and a culture of equity. They thus become agents of change, active agents of change, acting with what I call moral purpose and with active self-interest within their institutions to right racial wrongs rather than acting as allies in our struggle for racial justice. In other words, it need not have anything to do with us. But for me, the most disturbing part of that letter is this statement. Quote, we believe the groundswell of protests in the US and the UK represent a crucial moment for us, that's post George Floyd, as people directly affected by these issues. A crucial moment to call on the sector for help in, in eliminating racism, end of quote. So here is a body of BAME staff and their allies in higher education calling on the sector to help them get its knee off their neck. This language of allies and help projects global majority people in the sector as victims pleading for mercy and for support, as distinct from protagonists demanding equal rights and justice. The sector has a legal obligation to eliminate racism. It's not a matter of it deciding whether or not to help BAME people, staff and students to do so. So the starting points for me in this discussion are these. Discrimination at structural, cultural, institutional and personal levels persist in society and its institutions, including schooling and education. And that is why we have equality and human rights legislation to safeguard the rights and entitlements of the citizen, irrespective of their defining characteristics. The society validates white people automatically while requiring African and global majority people to prove themselves and to prove that they are eligible to be included. We are accountable to one another for the culture we create, the culture we inhabit and sustain, and for safeguarding the rights we enjoy. That's something I'll come back to in a while. Next slide, please. So, every one of us going into a workplace expects to be treated fairly we have a right to respect, and we expect there to be some consonance between the values and principles that the organization espouses and the way it conducts its business and the way it treats us and everybody else. Where there is that consonance, we feel a sense of wellness, we believe more in ourselves because that is reinforced in what we do and how we are treated, how we are validated. Uh, it, it releases our creativity and we have a sense of fulfillment. We look forward to going to work, to being part of a team 
because all of these things are rich and positive. In a consonant situation, there is more collectivism. People work together. They bind together as teams. They support and reinforce one another's strengths, helps others to eliminate the weaknesses. And there is generally a commonality of purpose. In those situations, everyone is working towards assisting the institution to fulfill its organizational goals. Next. The, the converse of that, of course, is dissonance. Where there's dissonance and you can't identify the values the organization uh, uh, lives by, um, it has a set of priorities which don't take account of your reality or that of anybody else. That induces all of those things, anxiety, stress, distrust, conflict, uh, mediocrity, especially mediocrity in performance, and it also induces a whole heap of cynicism. Next one. So the, the question we've got to ask ourselves then is, how do we ensure that we are allies by taking responsibility for what is happening around us because it is the proper thing to do as distinct from, if you like, defending Black people or sanctioning them in some way or another. Um, uh, when the George, George Floyd murder occurred, there was a lot of talk about silence uh, equaling complicity. Uh, let me give a, a, a typical example of, of, of what I mean. Uh, we find ourselves as Black people regularly in the situation where we are either the only one or there's only a few of us. Around boardroom tables, for example, uh, where you come together to discuss some strategic issue, um, you're a Black person bringing your experience of the organization to that setting. Uh, and you're listening to some stuff which is, to you at any rate, pretty worrying because it doesn't bear any relationship to how you experience the institution. Um, you, you, you decide to listen, and having listened for a while, you then make an intervention. That intervention is not necessarily taken on board. Some people simply gloss over it and move on. And then at the end of the session, you go out, you're having coffee or whatever it is, and a number of white colleagues come up to you and say, I really agreed with what you said, you know, and I didn't like the way in which it was dismissed or whatever. Now they expect you to feel very good about the fact that, you know, you are, you are at least being uh, acknowledged for what you did and, and the position that you took. But nobody, none of them, said anything at the time. The silence gave permission to the chair of the, of, the, of the meeting and to the organization as a whole to go ahead and do things which are not necessarily in the interest of the black staff and students in the place. So, so by being silent, you are complicit with the sustaining of those cultures that are marginalizing bruising or whatever, and you do, not, you do not begin to accept responsibility for that, for that complicity. Now that silence could be due to cowardice, it could be due to a lack of confidence, it could be due to basic ignorance, or for that matter, indifference. But it has, it has real consequences for those whom the decisions uh, affect. And, and, and it is an experience we have ever so often. Let's go to the next one. One of the other, one of the other um, um, uh, experiences is rendering Black people voiceless. What do I mean by that? Um, 
somebody gets up, a black person gets up in a meeting, uh, a seminar, a, a, a boardroom or whatever, and makes some observations, um, talking specifically out of their experience as black people in that place. And rather than engaging with and trying to understand what it is that they're actually saying, while they are interpreting the organization to itself, voices pop up arguing that really you have to take account of other people. Um, it's not only black people who are here, there are people with disabilities, there are whatever it is. As if the person making their assertions about their black experience uh, is actually denying that these other groups exist or that other things are happening to them. In other words, it's trying to put, it's trying to reinterpret and reconstruct one's experience of the racism, personal or institutional, within, within that organization and negate, neutralize the messages that the Black person is trying to convey. Now, that's something which happens a lot as, as white people who do not begin to question the source of their power or how they use that power interact with, 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 with Black people in those, in those situations. Um, and they do that with a sense of entitlement. So what does all of that mean in terms of how we, how, how we deal with it? It seems to me that the first thing we need to do is to take personal responsibility, as indeed both Marie and, and, and Malcolm were saying, personal responsibility to dismantle and unlearn. We, we need to develop, all of us, because in the same way that we have microaggressions in relation to race, we also have microaggressions in relation to issues of, of, of disability and, 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 and uh, um, um, homophobia and, 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 and so on. So we need to be mindful, mindful of how others experience our world, mindful of how other people experience our conduct, and mindful of how groups get othered within the society while we remain as part of the included in-group. What responsibilities um, um, does that place upon us? So the, the issue of our being in the world and what that means and what it must mean in a world in which there are these discriminations, in which power is, an, is unevenly distributed and un unevenly used, and what our responsibility is within that, whether we believe we have no power or not in the hierarchy of the institution, there is a power in our whiteness and the fact that the society validates that whiteness um, unquestioningly, whereas there are all kinds of question marks going up on people's foreheads once they have a, 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 a cause to be talking to or listening to what Black people are saying about their experiences. So I believe, I believe we need to really question that whole issue of allyship and ask why it is that in this HE sector to which we belong, most of us, um, in my case, for the last 70 years or so, I have had to be dealing with this, with, with, this, with this stuff. How is it that from one generation to the next, we go through having the same kinds of conversations, whereas the white majority in those places get on with life. Uh, they, don't have the, the, they don't have the problems of race to contend with generally. Um, nor do they necessarily ask the question, how do we manage, how do we continue to manage these institutions in a way that is so exclusionary and that does not allow people to come in the fullness within their black skin and be their best and give of their best 
in a situation where they are as concerned about the role of education in building a just and fair society as anybody else is. That I believe, my friends, is our challenge. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gus. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to, I'm just unsharing the, um, the video. So if we're gonna put everybody's cameras on, if we can put, oh, see my computer's gone again. So can I ask um, Closer and Fiona to put everybody's cameras and unmute? Oh. And then we're gonna start taking questions. So um, yeah, so thanks Gus, that was brilliant, excellent. Yeah, thank you all. So we're going to ask, like I said, we're going to do a combination of asking people questions from the Q&A, but also if, if, if you want to ask a question yourself directly, then you can just put your hands up in the, if you go into the participants, you should be able to put your hands up and we'll, um, we'll, we'll ask, let you ask a question personally. So whilst we're waiting for people to put their hands up, um, I'm going to ask Fiona if she can find a question um, and share it with, every, um, with the rest of the panel. Hi there, thanks Annette. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the, um, the first person who actually raised a question, just to give him credit for being the first one there um, early on in the session. Um, so this is from Adil um, Nasser. And um, he's asked the question around how effective the race equality charter mark has been in tackling the racism at our institutions? And should we continue to promote it as an indication of how our institutions are tackling racism? As the mark has become a, crea um, a bit of a creative writing exercise and manipulation of the data without tackling the actual real issues. Okay, thanks for that. So um, I'm going to ask all of the panels to give a brief answer, if you don't mind. So um, Dr. Marie Charles, do you want to go first? And if you can speak up, remember people can't hear you. So if you speak up, you're unmuted. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, I, I do think that's a, a, a wonderful statement made by your colleague, that it's an exercise in creative writing, because I don't see any evidence that it has made any impact at all on the policies and practices of individuals in those spaces. And if I can just give you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. So, yeah, if, you if, I can, if I can give you an example, uh, quite recently, um, I was in conversation with a senior uh, professor who was responsible for race and equality and changing the experiences of, of black pupils black students uh, in the academy and she said and she made a comment and she said um you know our we have interviewed a lot of our students and they don't feel safe they don't feel safe on the campus and she said i'm responsible for the equality uh documentation and responsible for changing some of the practices and behaviors of staff and you know we keep trying and i'm trying my best and we're not really getting anywhere and it was it, it it's this generic response of well i'm trying and i'm not really getting anywhere and the change is not really going to happen but but we're having all of this powerful evidence that says things need to change systemically within the system, black students don't feel safe. That is incredible. Black students don't feel safe in their learning spaces. And yet nothing has been done about it yet. Senior individuals, people with titles, uh, generally white people are not doing anything about it. And that is by design. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. So, um, um, uh, Malcolm, do you want to say something? Like I said, if you can be succinct yeah, and then we'll go to both. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, speak up, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, um, one of the things that I have to say that we need to remember that education is the main weapon that's been used against um, Africans and co colonized peoples. Um, first of all, it was the withholding of education, and then it was the brainwashing education 
that we're still suffering from. So the, the, the main thrust of domination uh, after violence was, was education. Education was the sort of thing to, to make you, uh, make everybody nice little Britons or whatever it is. And there is no actual um, attempt to change anything. Um, David Isaacs, who recently resigned from the EHRC, and he resigned months before he was meant to go, he was saying that race in all areas was not tackled by the EHRC. So something like this would need to be in the ambit of EHRC. Um, of course, they're not going to um, give us the change that we need because the more they can filibuster and delay or not do it at all, it won't become an issue. So people have to be wary of that, that education is a key weapon. Mm -hmm. And we have to do, whether you're Black Lives Matter or other organizations, have to do all they can to ensure that education um, kind of gets its act together. You know, this closing the gap, this, this decolonizing the curriculum, all these things, we need to we need to make those top challenges. Okay, thank you. And sorry, can I just say, um, Malcolm, that you know your view. Sometimes you're coming out of view on the video, so you may want to adjust your seating. Gus, do you want to give a response? Yes, very quickly. Um, uh, I do not see the race equality charter as a particularly positive thing, and as a matter of fact, I think it it uh, it detracts from the importance of ensuring that each institution, whether or not they decide to enter that race for the Equality Charter, um, um, is doing what they required by law to do. The Equality Act 2010 and the Race Relations Amendment Act 2000 before it uh, put certain requirements on each of these uh, public bodies, each of these uh, uh, um, institutions. And the question is, why should it be necessary to have a race equality charter and you give bronzes and silvers and I don't know, I don't know whether anybody has ever aspired to was a gold, uh, but, but it's, it's, it's artificial um, and it does, not, it does not ensure that what the law was meant to do is done. As I said in my presentation, the law is there to protect the rights and entitlements of those who are discriminated against in society for all kinds of reasons. What is necessary is for the government to ensure that there is a watchdog, uh, a, a monitoring mechanism to guarantee that each individual institution is doing what is required, that that is measurable. You can measure the impact of their actions and that those who are most affected, whether they be uh, 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 black women or black men or whatever else it may be, students and staff, have got the confidence that what is being done is making a difference in their lives. So the race equality charter stuff, I believe, is, 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 is another one of those gimmicks mm. that runs away from what needs to be done. And it makes certain people feel comfortable. Worse than that. There are institutions that, that spend a lot of time being creative, as was suggested by the questioner, being creative and, and writing all kinds of reams of stuff uh, in order to, to demonstrate that they're, they, 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 they're doing stuff. If you go to some of those same institutions, student surveys amongst black students and those black staff who feel confident enough to say what's actually happening to them would tell you a totally different story than what is in, presented in this race equality charter. So it is, it is unhelpful. And frankly, I believe the whole wretched thing should be got rid of. And we should all insist upon government taking solid measures to ensure that universities are doing what, what they should be doing. The one thing I know is this. Universities may not know, or for that matter, care very much about race. 
the one thing they care about is money. The one thing they care about. So if the government were to, to, to match, link their performance on dealing with the question of race to the amount of money that they get, then one would probably see a different, an acceleration of the pace at which change comes about. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to um, take two questions. Now I'm going to, the first one's going to be from, excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, it's going to be Mafalda Stasi. So just wait a moment, I'm going to give you, allow you to talk and just wait a moment. Okay, so Mafalda, you should have had a message for me now if you want to put your video on and if you want to ask your question. Unmute, unmute, I'll ask you to unmute. There yes, you um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, hi. Yes, um, I believe that um, the university is in a state of dissonance, as uh, the panelists said, and I want to um, give an example of a situation I'm in mean, often. Um, so I teach cultural studies and I do, like, you know, I say, okay, and I teach uh, black authors and I talk about the center in the class and I'm going blah, 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 Audrey Lord, bell hooks, blah. And then I look at my students and I'm the only white person in the room. At which point I'm kind of, ooh. And I, you know, I have choices, but I don't know, like, do I ask students how they feel, but I put them in the spot that could be really make it worse because I don't know how my students feel. I think I realize this fact, but I, I'm not them. So how do they feel? Presumably not happy, but I don't know. Do I ask them? Do I go on, do I say, do I go on about the neoliberal university? Um, like, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, does want to, uh, thank you for asking this question. I'm sure you're not the only person that's in this um, in this event that probably is thinking that. So, does somebody want to answer that question in particular out of our panel? I, I was I would say this. I think it is very important that you do know how your students feel. Um, I don't know, for example, what input they have in determining the curriculum that you teach or how you assess whether or not it is connecting with them in any way, shape or form. Nor do I know the extent to which they are allowed to bring from their own experiences and backgrounds, the sorts of stuff which you yourself, you yourself might not be taking on board. I mean, it is not that long ago that when you looked at literature courses in universities, um, you, you had a very white and European uh, 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 um, menu that were being thrown at students irrespective of their backgrounds. The situation is changing, thankfully. But, but, but I, I believe all of that is particularly important, especially in a situation where um, uh, students are not seeing teachers who look like them and they can't make very many assumptions about what, therefore, that teacher would know about them, their background, their experiences, or the struggles of, 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 the, of the groups to which they belong. So it's, it's really quite important that there are mechanisms for them to, to, to give feedback, uh, to, to make contributions to curriculum building, and, 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 and even curriculum, curriculum delivery. I mean, the way in which you would work with a group like that, um, uh, if you're not just doing the didactic, you know, standing in front of a class thing, is very powerful. So, so you, you don't need, there's no need to be apologetic about the fact that you're a white teacher standing in front of them, is what you, what you bring to that experience and how, therefore, you ensure that their voices are the ones that determine the trajectory of the teaching. Okay, thanks, Gus. We've got, we've, we haven't got much time, and we've got quite a lot of questions, actually. So thank you very much. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to take another direct question. So, um, Viv, if you just bear with me. So this is from Viz Brosnan. 
um, oops, sorry, that's my reminder going off. So I'm just going to make this, Viv, you can put your camera on, hopefully, and speak. And again, I'm going to ask you to be very succinct and for people to give them um, succinct um, answers as well, because, yeah. Why don't you take two or three at a time, Annette? No, because I'm doing, sorry, guys, I'm, we're doing some in the Q&A. We'll do that from the, the other one, okay, don't worry. We will do. Right, right, right. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So are you on mute? Can you unmute? I think, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks, Annette. Right. Thank you to the speakers. I've really enjoyed uh, listening to you today. Um, my question actually goes back to something I think that um, Dr. Maria said, but also certainly what Professor um, Gus John said about the experiences of black students in universities. There was a program on it a week or so ago, and it was black students sharing their experiences of being at Cambridge University. And it was heartbreaking listening to some of them. But there's one student in particular who said that she'd been racially abused on a train. Um, either leaving university or going back. But I think what struck me was the response from the, from the person. The person happened to be a tutor from the university wearing their lanyard. And when she challenged him and said that, actually, you're, that's a, you're racially abused me and I've got to report it. He said, well, I've got lots of friends at university, so I don't really care, so you can do what you like. Um, it was heartbreaking because when she was interviewed, that poor girl, she was in tears. You could see that it had really struck her, you know, and I just, I've worked in lots of universities over the years, so I know this isn't uncommon, but what are the panel's views on this? Bearing in mind, you know, that more and more black students are, are going to university and Cambridge is also hold themselves as a beacon of saying they want to encourage black students. Okay, thank you very much. So can we give very quick answers because then we're going to take a few more questions. So Marie, do you want to go first? Um, Malcolm, you yeah, go first this time. Don't let Malcolm go first because he hasn't gone first yet. Malcolm, do you want to go first? Then Marie and then Gus if you need to. I, I, I don't know what links that person had to Cambridge, but yeah, as I said in my piece, um, I, I was there about three or four years ago in that uh, Trinity College at Cambridge. And actually, what people were saying was absolutely dire it was terrible that their experiences and and uh, when they say they talk to students at other universities they say oh, well you're up at cambridge uh, you know we we <laughs> we get treated badly so you must be okay up there you know but it's it's universities again you know whether it's cambridge oxford or or the ex polytechnic down the road it's sort of um it's the same thing, as I was saying earlier on about education, that there are... I don't know what's going on there, Malcolm. You've gone quiet, so hold on a minute. We can't hear you, even though you're not muted. So we'll come back to you in a minute, Malcolm. Let, let, Marie, do you want to say something before we go take another question? Because I think we're going to take some of the questions. Yes, it, it, it relates to the very opening um, of what I presented. And it, it's almost as if we have this schism and we have to learn how to psychologically equip ourselves to navigate these spaces in which these microaggressions and the dominant culture is able to uh, make us feel less than and, and not valued as human beings. So once we work on ourselves, and we build up our reservoirs of strength, our own PPE, that is critical. And that we also form communities and connections with kinship. Those support groups and those mechanisms are critical when we navigate those white spaces. Without that, the system will devour us and eat us up. We're all recipients of a system um, and those experiences mm -hmm. as children, as college students, where we have felt attacked, insulted, and, and all of those things on our sense of self. But if you don't have the strategies to deal with that internally, I'm not saying that we're robots and we're superhuman, but this is something that you have to work on every day. Like you bathe every day. You have to bathe in this PPE every day. And that means going to our learned colleagues like Professor Gus John and uh, Malcolm Cumberbatch and Annette, that, that, that we know where to go for that help and that support and that confidence. But self is everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you, said very passionately. So um, we'll come back to you, hopefully, Malcolm, in a moment. So, um, Kosa, would you like to give us two questions at the same time because uh, we're running out and then we'll go back to the... Yes. Okay, thank you. So the first question is, 
is racism only a white thing? And another question we have is, uh, the, um, somebody is asking um, if the panelists could say something about, um, oh, sorry, uh, Professor Gosgen, this is directed at you. Uh, you came up with the term global majority, a more powerful term than the derogatory term Bain. Could you please say something about the term and why? Okay, so let's do the first one first. So, what, what was that? Is racism only a white thing? Is racism. Okay, thank you. Can we have quick answers? Let's, so, let's, 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 um, let's use the time as profitably as we can. Um, it, it's, 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 it's clearly an, an, an important question. But in the context of, 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 of this particular uh, conversation, I'm not quite sure why we want to be spending a lot of time on that. Um, um, my reason for saying that is that clearly what we are ex experiencing as black people in education, schooling, college, university is such, and it is so embedded, it is such a manifestation of the endemic racism within the society that frankly, right now, that's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm not. I'm not interested in whether there there are there are other forms of racisms elsewhere. What I'm dealing with is the fact that for 400 years, black people are constantly the ones who are marginalized, excluded, exploited, subject of genocide, and the rest of it. And we are engaging in this situation right now with how we and the white people around us can come to some understanding of our respective roles and responsibilities. Okay, thank you. So I think we'll just leave it at that for that question. So what was the other one for, for Gus about the global majority? And then we'll do one. So, so okay. um, Gus, you came up with the term global majority. Can you please say something about the term and why? Yes, um, um, I find BAME, Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic, a pretty odious term, which I, which I don't use. Um, uh, global majority, and one of the reasons why it is so odious is that is that it 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 minoritizes people, um, and 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 suggests that that um, we have been so othered that we can only conceive our as of ourselves as othered on the basis of the divisions that white society around the world creates. Now, it's about reclaiming, reclaiming self, reclaiming the centrality of Africa as the source of all life. That's where we all started. It doesn't matter how gray, green, or pink we may have become over the centuries, but that's where we started. And it is also saying that if you have a majority consciousness, if you have a sense of the part you have played in the world because of your philosophies, your histories, your scientific inventions and everything else, which as knowledge has evolved, as epistemologies have developed, they have sidelined, which is why we complain about ethnocentris ethnocentrism, Eurocentrism, in, 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 in curriculum, then it is important that we remind the world and particularly backward places like Britain, that we are in the majority. The, the size of the Indian subcontinent, the size of Southeast Asia, the size of Africa and its populations is such that it is totally ridiculous to think in terms of people as, as minority ethnic anything, especially as Black, white people themselves don't see themselves as a majority ethnic group. They just are. They don't have to be ethnic anything because being white is the norm. And that's what we have to, we have to cut across. Language is powerful. And the fact that my grandchildren, some 70 years after their grandparents came to this country, or, or their great-grandparents came to this country, are being still treated in schools like ethnic minorities and as if they came only yesterday mm -hmm. is really quite scandalous, it seems to me. It is. So I mean, we abandon this notion of BAME mm -hmm. and begin to engage 
with black British people from Africa, black British people from the Indian subcontinent, black British people from the Philippines or whatever else it may be, and see, let people have that power within their own sense of identity and the contributions that they have made through the ancestry to the world. Okay, sorry, thank you, Chris. I'm sorry, because we are coming to the end. So um, thank you all for you, you know, um, Dr. Marie and Malcolm. Is there one thing that you'd like to say? Can you just make it very brief? Well, brief? thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Dr. Marie. Thank I'd you. just like to pick up just on that last point that, that Gus just made and mm -hmm. throw a cat among the pigeons. Mm -hmm. that, that some of the work that I'm doing now is showing that the First Nation people that were here in Britain were black and the, the original name, this is exclusive, the original name of Britain was Ba Ta Ankh, which was named by the Phoenicians. Now, I'm just going to leave it there and I'm okay. working on that chapter. Okay, well, maybe you'll come back and you'll, you know, you can share that with the rest of us another time. Uh, Malcolm, can we hear you now? Do you want to try and speak? I still can't hear you, so I don't know what's happened, Malcolm. It's unfortunate because you're not muted. So something's happened with your computer or with the internet. So um, I'm going to have to apologise and say thanks on your behalf, Malcolm. I'm really sorry. Um, yeah. I have no idea. Oh, we can hear you now. We can hear you. Oh, you just muted yourself. Cool. Try again quickly. That's it. Try. Right. That's it, quick, yes. You can hear me? Yes, very yeah. briefly. No, I, yeah, I, I'm concentrating on identity and in the struggle, um, because without identity and where you're from and where you're going, it, it's pointless. You can't prosecute the struggle. You can't do anything. Uh, and I want to say to Black Lives Matter people, there's a lot to do in between one outrage and another, and that's and I hope that they get something from today. Um, and I know it's a big subject, but we need to keep on this. As Gus was saying, it's over 400 years and it's not got any better. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all. Um, we could have talked about this, to be honest, for quite much, much, much longer. So, um, yes. but you know, it's good, good that we've um, filled up the whole 90 minutes. Um, Thank you all. Um, we're going to, this is recorded and we will be sharing this on the new BME, Coventry University BME Staff Network website shortly. But thank you all. Thank you, Gus, Dr. Marie. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. Kosa and Fiona, you've been a star. And thank you to all the audience for your patience. The questions that are still remaining, we're going to copy and paste them and then we'll share them with the panelists and perhaps share them uh, be able to share them with you later. But there is a survey. You are um, given the option to complete a survey when you leave this. So it'd be really helpful for us if you could fill that survey in. Okay, then. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank, we'll you. Leave thank, now. You. thank you, everyone. Thank you.